Welcome to the SEIU UHW Facebook live stream uh, session uh, to provide information and an update on the ongoing situation with COVID-19 or as many people are referring to it, coronavirus. So my name is Dave Reagan. I'm the president of UHW and I am joined this evening by a number of UHW members who will introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, and a special guest that we have. Uh, and before we get to introductions, I, I really want to just spend uh, a minute or so reminding people why it is that we think it's important to do this and what we hope to accomplish. Uh, given that we are literally now dealing with a global pandemic and probably the most serious public health crisis that we've had, uh, certainly in my memory and probably in my lifetime, it's hard to overstate what's at stake, um, how serious this is, uh, and the fact that it's going to take an incredibly uh, comprehensive and disciplined and serious response to uh, deal effectively with this pandemic and all of the associated issues. So here in UHW, you know, we want the union to be a place where we create forms like this. So we as healthcare workers, uh, but also as family members and community members and people who are connected to lots of different folks in our lives. We want this to be a place where you can come and get up to the minute, top shelf, high quality information, where you have a chance to ask questions, uh, and where at the end of the day, what we're going to do here tonight can then be shared with your coworkers and with uh, family members and friends and anybody you like. Uh, I want to say uh, at the outset that we are committed to doing these live stream events uh, every week. We think Wednesday night is a, a good time to do it, but we will do these every week uh, for as long as it takes for us to uh, deal with this epidemic. Um, and we'll try to make sure that we get different people and different voices uh, coming in through the course of the conversations. I also want to say at the outset that in the past we've done some of these live stream events which have been specific to certain employers that we have in UHW, whether that's Kaiser or our other employers. Um, but I want to uh, be clear that this is an event that we are opening to everybody in UHW and to the, the general public. And again, we think this is such an important situation and such a serious situation. Uh, that we want people to know that every Wednesday evening will be an opportunity to participate in a discussion like this uh, and where, again, you'll get top shelf information, it'll be timely, it'll be up to date, uh, and you'll be able to get your questions answered. So uh, with that, I want to, um, I'll first give a, a you know, just a, a very brief introduction uh, to our special guest and then I'll give uh, each of our member guests uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, before we get into the, the balance of what we want to do. And let me also be clear that we want to make sure that in the course of the hour that we're going to spend here tonight, we want to make sure at least half of the time is available uh, for questions and answers for people who are out there and, and watching this. So uh, I'll allow uh, our guest, Dr. Perotti, to say more about himself in a moment, but I just wanted to begin uh, by appreciating and thanking Dr. Stephen Perotti uh, who is the Chief Infectious Control Officer at Kaiser Permanente and an epidemiologist by training uh, and somebody who's really been leading uh, KP's response to this situation. Uh, and he's here tonight to just share the very best scientific information, the evidence, uh, the public health protocols and guidelines that we have, and we're grateful that he was able to take time uh, and join us tonight. So we'll come back to you in a second, but thank you very much on behalf of all of UHW for joining us. Um, and now I want to give this lovely lady a chance to introduce herself and then uh, two guests, member guests who are with us remotely. Go ahead, Ruby. So good evening, everyone. My name is Ruby Robley. I am with Kaiser Permanente, the Antioch Medical Center, and I am from respiratory therapy. Great. And then uh, remotely, we'll go to our member guest, uh, that good looking gentleman with the headphones. Dennis, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Dennis Anderson. Uh, I am a phlebotomist at Dignity Health. I've been working with Dignity Health for 20 years now. Thanks, Dennis. And last but certainly not least. 
So, hi everybody. My name is DeBru Carthen. I am the contract specialist for Modesto Tracy. Uh, when I'm not the contract specialist, I'm the lead radiologic technologist at Kaiser and Modesto, and I've been with Kaiser for 23 years. Okay, so thank you to DeBru and Dennis and Ruby, and all of us will be participating in this conversation over the next hour. Um, before I ask Dr. Perotti uh, to say a little bit more, uh, you know, really and most intensively in the last couple of weeks, we like everybody else has been trying to figure out what's the best way to respond, what's the best way uh, to get in front of this very rapidly progressing uh, disease that we're all dealing with. Um, and as I've learned, uh, in part through conversations with Dr. Perotti and others, the, the real uh, strategic issue that public health officials and healthcare providers and healthcare systems are grappling with um, is a question that could be termed as a mitigation strategy versus a containment strategy. And all I'll say about that is that we certainly recognize that there is no question that here in California and across the country and frankly across the world, this disease is no longer contained. It is being transmitted in the community. Um, it therefore has the ability to spread much more quickly. And I think a lot of what Dr. Perotti is gonna talk about is how that simple principle, uh, mitigation versus containment, uh, plays out. We've also asked him to talk uh, with us and share with us, you know, what is the best scientific information we have? What is the cutting edge uh, approach to this from public health officials and uh, people who have this kind of background and training? Uh, and also to give us uh, a sense of what's going on in the state of California and with the federal government uh, and to just be able to talk about all of that. But with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Perotti. And again, appreciate you being here today. Yeah, well, thank you, Dave, for, for inviting me to, to speak to you and actually all of your membership. Um, it is a real tremendous opportunity. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. Um, so when you think about uh, the disease, the coronavirus, this is essentially a cold virus. Um, it is in the same family as them. Um, but what's different is it's new. Um, we have not uh, experienced it before. We actually don't have immunity to it uh, across the world. Um, and it appears to spread much more easily than seasonal influenza. Um, so it makes it much more difficult to contain. Um, the other things that we know about it uh, is that it generally causes mild disease. Um, so almost 80% of the people who get infected with it generally just get a cold. And they actually may be completely asymptomatic. So that means that they actually don't have any symptoms at all. And unfortunately, people who are asymptomatic can spread it. So in fact, um, it's, it's number one, easier to spread. And number two, people are not, not necessarily coming in to see us. They don't come into the healthcare uh, system to see a doctor or their provider. Um, and they could be inadvertently spreading it in the communities. Um, the other thing that we do know is that it can cause severe disease for certain people. So if you are older, um, and older is defined as 60 or older, um, if you have chronic conditions, so like heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, or lung disease, you're at higher risk for having complications or even having to be hospitalized, and some people have died. Um, the other thing that is a moving target is how many people are at risk for dying. Um, and there have been a lot of confusing reports out there. And part of the reason for that is because we actually don't know all of who's been infected with this disease. Um, so in fact, because so many people are asymptomatic and they don't come in, there's probably a larger number of people that have gotten infected relative to the number of people who died. So that's why you've seen varying reports in the news and why we're still learning about it. Um, the bottom line is it's a new virus. We've got to take it seriously. And it's similar to some of the other epidemics that I've had to confront as an infectious disease specialist. I've been with Kaiser Permanente for 17 years, so actually shorter than some of my, my <laughs> colleagues here that I, I share the stage with, um, but actually led the, the pandemic response in 2009 and 10 to H1N1 influenza, um, which is really actually kind of a good key case in point in how do you confront a pandemic? Um, and so I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail. 
Because the other thing that is really important to remember with this coronavirus, as it was true for the influenza pandemic uh, virus, is it's spread by respiratory droplets. So just to sort of explain that, um, droplets are things that come out of your mouth when you cough or when you sneeze. And they're literally what they mean, droplets. So they drop. Um, so the, the virus is carried in the spittle itself and can only travel up to six feet away. So that's different from other viruses that can be airborne. So something like measles, actually when you cough, can float in the air for prolonged periods of time. So that's an important distinguishing uh, difference between both the other viruses that are airborne and this one, coronavirus, because there are certain protections that you can take on a basic public health basis. And so just in a nutshell, the typical things that we do for flu, covering the cough, um, you know, washing your hands and the alcohol hand gels work just as well as soap. And if you walk through a soap for 20 seconds, it kills the virus. Um, and it doesn't live on surfaces for prolonged periods of time. Um, and for the most part, based on all the information we have out of China and out of Italy, is this is primarily spread by close contact with individuals and generally prolonged close contact. Um, so it's not as easily caught if you're socially distanced from other people, literally three feet away, you're generally protected against it. And if you're pretty arduous and assiduous about washing those hands, um, you can prevent the spread of this disease. So those are sort of the things that are known about this. Now, Dave was actually referring to something that's really important. So when you see a new virus out in the community, the first thing that we try to do is contain it. So what does that mean? In general, if you have a few people that are infected with a new virus, and we did this with SARS virus um, you know, in 2003, we were able to stop it because we could find those individuals who were sick with it, put them in one place, put all the people that were exposed to those people and put them in one place. And that's what's called containment. Um, and then you keep those people from the rest of the community. Now, in the case of coronavirus and COVID-19, the cat's really out of the bag at this point. So essentially, the virus, particularly in California, but we're seeing this in hotspots around the US now, um, the virus is being transmitted around in the community. So, when we first started with this outbreak about three to four weeks ago in the United States, we essentially were containing it in hospitals. So we would identify a patient, put them in the hospital. And the problem now is that despite those measures, we now see the spread in the communities. So when you think about it, we then need to think about what's the next strategy. So if containment isn't the strategy, the next sort of measure is to mitigate it. And what does mitigation mean? And maybe some of you have heard this already in the news, but mitigation is essentially slowing down the spread of the virus. And this is really key and important because we as healthcare professionals um, and as healthcare workers all have a part to play in slowing down the spread. So from a public health perspective, the way you do this is you create social distancing. Um, so you've seen in the news closures of schools. Um, closures of sporting events. And really what you're doing there is you're preventing a lot of people from coming together and potentially spreading the virus much more quickly. And why is that important? Well, that allows the healthcare system to be ready for a surge, but it's a controlled surge as opposed to all at once. Um, so it allows us to be prepared um, and it allows actually the rest of society to be prepared. So those are actually good standard public health measures. And if you think about it, we used to do this a lot. Um, some of us can remember you know, measles outbreaks in schools where we would shut down the school to stop the outbreak. So those are similar measures. We just haven't had to do them as much because we have vaccines. So the, the second thing, you know, if you think about it as a healthcare system, um, is that we can help slow and mitigate the spread by making sure that we have the right equipment available. So using the right personal protective equipment um, that's wearing the right face masks, shields in terms of face shields, gowns and gloves helps prevent and protect the healthcare workforce from this illness. Um, and what we've learned because it's droplet borne is in general, if you're not performing high risk procedures, they're going to generate aerosols. So if you're not going, you're not doing active intubation, you're not doing bronchoscopy, 
that in general you can use droplet borne precautions to protect yourself uh, from this illness. Um, and this is going to become critically important because we have to be thinking about the supply chain for all the equipment that we do use in the hospitals. And all of you are probably familiar with the fact that China had to reduce their manufacturing capacity in response to the viral outbreak because they were doing those social distancing things I was just talking about. So we, and I'm not just talking about Kaiser Permanente, we as the entire healthcare industry is ha are having to look at what is the availability of all the equipment that we have and how do we make sure it's preserved so we can take on this outbreak for the period of time that it's going to be here. And based on what we're seeing out of China, we've got to be prepared for like a three to four month response here at least. Um, because I think we've got to assume that what we saw in China could happen here in terms of just being prepared for the amount of illness that's here. So um, making sure that we have the training available, um, that we're confident about what we're doing, um, making sure that in terms of where the patients are going, that they're going to get the cold and cough taken care of with the right equipment on is going to be key to stopping in the spread of this disease. So I'd like to ask one follow-up question, sure. and then we're going to ask each of our member leaders to talk a little bit about their own experience. But you said something just a moment ago that I think is really important, which is a, a question I've heard in the last few days, saying that we need to be prepared for at least a three to four month window, right, where this is still a really dangerous and precarious situation. Um, say a word, if you will, you touched on it about keeping healthcare workers safe because this is a droplet borne and not an airborne thing. If you could say a few words about what's the difference between a low risk exposure and medium risk and high risk, and then just about the importance of us keeping the workforce safe so the workforce is there to take care of the general public. And then we'll turn to our member leader. But if you could comment on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, thanks. And, and I'll, I'll be brief about it. But when you think about a low risk exposure, I mean, that's where essentially you're wearing the, the appropriate gear. Um, you've had the, the proper training and you have minimal to no risk. Where it becomes a higher risk is if we have people coming in and you're not wearing the proper gear. Um, so for example, if you don't have a face mask on, um, or you don't have the gowns and gloves on, and then you inadvertently are taking care of someone, um, and then realize later, or we screen later for COVID-19, that's when there's a higher risk exposure. So one of the things that's really key, and then I'll, I'll turn it over, um, is uh, making sure that we've got screening processes in place. So when people are coming into points of care that we're asking about cold and cough, getting a mask on the individuals who do have a cough and rooming them right away. That's going to minimize exposure. Okay. So I want to turn now to Ruby. Um, and I think I'll just preface this by saying today across large parts of Kaiser, we saw an important step towards making sure that we're taking all the appropriate measures to deal with traffic, to deal with um, the kinds of issues you've touched on. So Ruby, if you could talk just a little bit about your experience at your location, um, both in terms of working with your management team and then what you experienced today. So um, I'll, I would like to start by saying how proud I am of Kaiser Permanente at the Antioch campus because after a few days of struggling on both sides, we were definitely on different pages of communication and how we were going to work through this, but we were, um, both sides were com very committed to our patients and the employees. We were able to sit down with senior leadership from the COO guy all the way with our AMGA, even the EVS manager. We had um, several of our labor leaders with us. We all sat down, we went through our UHW checklist. Is that, I'm sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> Can we see that? Because our checklist, we went through it with our leadership and literally we talked about pathways on when a patient comes in through the ED or walks in through the front door not knowing what to do, how we were going to follow. And we literally followed our checklist successfully at Antioch. We talked about numbers. We talked about how much equipment. 
we have, PPE, how much we will have to get in the future, what the probability of getting that equipment, you know, and talking about our patients, um, how many of our own members are on leave because of exposure, or what is happening on our house. It was very important just to talk about Antioch, and it was a successful meeting. We are still meeting. There are issues that we need to work through. But again, today for Martinez and Delta Fair, which is a clinic at Antioch, we were able to start the alternative care services. Um, and what this is, why this service was started is to reduce our foot traffic on campus. So this is a process by which it is these tents, these uh, areas are um, staffed by a physician, a nurse, an LVN and an MA, and the physician taking lead by a telephone appointment, asking the patient questions, moving it forward, writing an e-consult. The patient comes in, gets into their car, at a time and, and goes to one of our campuses, Delta Fair or uh, Martinez, and drives up actually through a pathway, and there's cones, and they can go through and get swabbed by an LVN or an RN at that moment. The patient does not leave the car. The nasal swab is taken in just a few seconds, and the patient leaves and goes home and stays there until the clinic advises them on, on what the results is. So we had uh, about five patients today. We will increase the hours as needed. We will increase the staff. For Martinez and Antioch, the leadership there has been very supportive in saying yes, that they will in fact increase our staffing levels to cover these. Because again, this whole alternative care service is that we wish to lower our foot traffic into our clinics and into our hospitals. We need to try to control things as doctor has said. So today was very successful with just one little glitch. And I have to tell you that a patient took it upon himself, showed up at the wrong clinic, the wrong time. So we rerouted him and started the protocol from the beginning. And the protocols are listed. We have um, all of our PPE equipment dedicated to this site. So that's very important if you're out there at other Kaiser locations that we make sure our PPE equipment is dedicated specifically for the ACS or for our ED or the front door where we will have now um, greeters and screeners. With, with our masks and things. We need to keep track of our numbers. So for us, um, after a little bit, as I said, after a little bit of tug and pull between labor and management, we were able to sit down. But we are monitoring things very closely. Okay. And, you know, I appreciate, you know, Ruby, and it's helpful to be having this conversation tonight because this is literally in the last 12 hours that this has started. And so yes. this conversation is timely. But again, this is a conversation we're having across UHW. And so one of the things we're hopeful is both our Kaiser members having an opportunity to hear your experience, compare it to their own. Um, but hopefully this is helpful for people outside of Kaiser too and how they're working with their employers, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but now I'd like to turn to Dennis, uh, again in the Sacramento area with Dignity. And Dennis, if you could talk a little bit about your experience at your facility and with your employer. Sure, sure. Um, I, I'll say that, uh, hi, again, Dennis, I'm from Dignity Health. I'm out in Folsom. Uh, we, we actually had one of the, uh, uh, one of the first uh, COVID-19 cases from the, the Japanese cruise at our facility. And, um, you know, from, from my experience out in the field, um, it's, it's been a little rough. Um, it, there's been a lot of changing policies, a lot of uncertain policies. Um, there's been some uneven communication and communicating with staff and frontline workers. And so um, 
it's been, uh, I, I just, I feel a lot of unease when I talk to a lot of my coworkers right now, but we are getting things on track. We are staying on top of the employer. And um, honestly, I think that's the only way that we can get through this is when employers sit down with frontline workers and figure out how to solve a lot of these problems that we'll be seeing ahead of us. So, um, yeah, uh, this week and next week in Dignity Health, we're beginning conversations between uh, union members and um, Dignity leadership. And so I, th I think we're slowly getting on the right track. But uh, for, for now, from my experience, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think we're going to see it through. So uh, let me see if I'm capturing what you're saying in a in a fair way, Dennis, I think, you know, what you're trying to communicate is that, you know, we're starting to make a little bit of headway with your employer and your facility. We frankly think it should have happened quicker. Uh, a little bit of frustration about being able to get a leadership meeting at your location, but that it looks like those are starting to pick up. Is that an accurate summation? Very. Okay. All right, and I, I want to come back to that in a moment after we hear from Debru. So Debru, how about your experience in Modesto? Oh, you're on mute, Debru. Debru, you have to come off mute. Yeah, I was. There, there you I'm go. Mute. So, um, <laughs> no problem. Thanks. So last week we started um, the conversations with the COO and uh, the, uh, the infection control uh, doctors. And um, we did give them our checklist. We had questions. They uh, have not gotten back to us regarding our checklist. We were told that um, they had to vet our questions at the regional level. Uh, we did send a, a email stating that we um, we were not very happy or satisfied with that response. We needed some answers to those questions because they're very important questions. We did have a town hall today um, and we went over some of the uh, same things that Dr. Perotti just talked about. Um, our, our members are being informed, but we do need to talk about staffing levels. Um, when you say there's training going on, we understand that there's a lot of training going on with the ED side and the hospital side. Um, we're a little more concerned at this point about the clinics. Um, there has been some flyers that have went out, but we're getting some feedback from members that they don't feel that they're getting enough training. So we will be following up on that um, to find out what specifically are we doing for our frontline staff. Um, there was a concern about supplies. Uh, I guess there's issues with people going in other areas and taking some of the supplies from different places and upper management and upper leadership, they're aware of this. Um, and they just you know, want to make sure that we are using our supplies um, sparingly. Uh, we want to be safe, but we, we, we have to plan for the long run because we don't want to run out of supplies. Um, there is a lot of um, signage out for our members. Um, and today we did start the um, alternate uh, where people could drive up. And for the whole Central Valley, uh, as far as I know right now, it's only in Modesto. So everybody will be coming to Modesto to be tested. Uh, I don't know the number of people who went to that alternate today. I will find that out tomorrow. We are um, understanding that the hospital, we as a hospital and as healthcare workers, we need to um, make sure that member members' um, privacy is protected. Um, but then too, we do have members who are just wanting to know, do we have positive cases? Are there cases around us? Can we be um, a little more informed? Of course, at the end of the day, we have to wash our hands and take all the precautions with everybody. It's just some of the not knowing, I think is leading to some of the, the what if. Um, you know, we, when you're in a meeting and someone coughs, 
people are starting to look at people kind of sideways and a cough could just be a cough. And we just really need to make sure that we're washing our hands and do, doing what we need to do. Um, we're not handshaking, we're uh, fist pounding from a distance. Um, and also uh, when we're opening doors and things of that nature, we're using either a, an elbow or something where we're not touching the surface that everyone else is touching. So we just really um, have some follow-up to do in the Central Valley. Uh, we are progressing. It's just uh, we want to make sure that those questions get back to us, the answers get back to us from region um, sooner than later. Okay. So, Dr. Perotti, before we turn to the, the next section, um, in a, from a KP perspective, if you could speak, uh, I think it would be helpful for people to understand um, how widespread is the move that we heard from mm -hmm. Ruby and Debru to the alternate alternative care setting with the drive-throughs if you could say a word about that and then if whatever your thoughts are on just the the privacy issues Debru uh, reference that would be helpful. That's a great question so for the alternative sites um, we've actually asked as of today for all of the medical centers to open up those sites mm -hmm. Um, and those are that you're referencing. Sorry to interject. North and South in California. So I'm speaking to the North. To the North. I'm okay. Speaking to the North. I can't speak for, for okay. Southern California. I'm sorry. So my operate, we, we sorry, I'm the infectious disease guy for the whole, Northern California. for actually the whole country, oh. but but for the operations part of it, I'm, I'm a Northern Got California it. guy. So so I'll, I'll speak to that. Okay. Um, but we did ask um, all the sites to begin opening up. The alternative testing sites that you were referencing earlier. Um, we have also asked them to start looking at alternative care sites. Um, and we did this in, during the pandemic flu response where you had a tent set up where you right. could do medical evaluation. So beyond the testing. Why? Because ideally you want foot traffic, if it comes in, that's cold and cough to be coming to a certain area rather than having it traverse all over. Now we know, you know, some of it's gonna not yeah. all go there. So, I mean, then you have to have alternative workflows. Right. Um, so we're, we're actually gonna be pushing those out to the medical centers in the next day. Um, so, cause we think we've got to ramp up because I think one of the questions I heard was, you know, is it here? How much of it is here? Um, based on what we're seeing, and again, I'll speak Northern California specific for a second, but I think this is really statewide, this is my opinion, um, is that it is already here. Um, the call center information that we're seeing is the number of calls we're getting per day related to COVID is around 1,600 a day now, um, where it was like 200 a day a week ago. Mm -hmm. so, so the virus is here, um, and, and so the, the good news is I think we got the means to take care of this thing. Um, and so it's about, you know, how do we make sure we get the right people the right place at the right time? Okay. And privacy. Privacy, privacy questions. Privacy. So, you know, when you think about, you know, all of us would have an expectation if we were a patient um, that, you know, if I have a diagnosis that, you know, it's, it's shared between the providers and myself uh, and not the greater community. Um, my message to, to all of you tonight is, is just what we were talking about. COVID-19 is here. I would assume that we need to be uh, aware of and taking care of people as if they might have COVID-19. Um, and I'll just say within the, the healthcare system, this does speak to the North and South for Kaiser Permanente. We've had cases in our medical centers that we've taken care of. Um, and, and actually we've been able to do it successfully. Um, and I want to reference one other thing um, that, that I think is really key, and you, you were touching on it earlier, um, is, is the protocol, but it's also having the safety monitoring in place. So, you know, when we've had people hospitalized with COVID-19, of course, the healthcare worker themselves is taking care of the patient, but there's somebody actually making sure, did they put the gear on? Did they take the PPE off correctly? Right. The donning and doffing, the checklist. Those are all key to being successful here. Okay. Great. So let me, you know, uh, Dr. Perotti obviously deals in, you know, day-to-day -day operations at Kaiser, but inside of UHW, we have our hospital division and a whole range of employers and systems, including, you know, Dignity, HCA, Tenet, large independent institutions like Stanford and Cedar sinai and plenty of others that I'm leaving off. 
Um, I just want to, again, remind people this is a, a basic checklist that we've tried to distribute across the union. Ruby was referencing it earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing most people have seen this, but if you haven't, uh, this is something uh, that you can get from your steward, from your rep, it's available. Um, and what we're recommending, I'm going to talk about a non-Kaiser context right now, but for our hospital division members and your employers, um, we're, you know, we have made a request of all of our employers to hold a leadership meeting at the facility level uh, so that we can review the checklist, we can talk about the whole range of issues, many of which we've covered in the conversation tonight. Um, some of our employers have been very responsive and, you know, been terrific to work with. Others, you know, there's a whole range of experience. Um, but if you're struggling at your facility and for whatever reason, your particular leadership and your particular employer is dragging its feet or not willing to meet, um, we want to make sure not just are we following up with them inside of uh, UHW, um, but we've also been in communication with officials at the state of California, and they've asked us to please keep them informed about, you know, who's, you know, really being cooperative and collaborative, and then employers that are being resistant and unwilling, they've asked us to share that information as well. And just a word about uh, the state and county level uh, public health officials, and, and you may want to speak to this, Dr. Perotti. Um, the guidance uh, and what we believe is now happening at the state level is that, um, you know, there's constant reevaluation of what's going on here and really moving closer to pursuing as fully and comprehensively a mitigation strategy. And we expect to hear more of that from the state. Um, and at the county level, we've seen just in the last couple of days, such as in Sacramento County, where the county has really come out much more aggressively and said, we're embracing even more strongly a mitigation strategy. So I know you're in touch with all these officials and, and, uh, and I think it would also be good for our hospital division folks. You mentioned earlier tonight when we were just talking privately that you're in touch with a lot of our other employers. So you could say a word about the, uh, the state and county officials as well as your interactions with our other employers. Yeah, so I, I think this is really key and important. If we're going to be successful in addressing this, we have to be working hand in glove with public health um, and public health officials. Um, so we're in regular contact at the county level, at the state level, and then in fact with CDC as well. And one of the things that's actually really important about a new pandemic is that constant change of the information, which can be really frustrating and it can be confusing um, and, and actually feed into fear around the epidemic. So, um, you know, one of the key things is that we've been I'm talking about Kaiser Permanente, but it's also the other health systems because I'm working with similar colleagues to me um, in the Sutter system, Common Spirit, um, working with the California Medical Association, the California Hospital Association to make sure that we are on the same page, we're singing on the same song sheet, um, and that we're moving towards mitigation um, in a more lockstep fashion. It has been a little, I mean, quite frankly, it has been piecemeal. Um, part of that is just based on the epidemiology. You, you only know what you know. So Sacramento um, was one of the leads, and of course, Solano County as well, um, where the public health officers have taken, you know, action, um, that, that has been in conjunction with the health systems. So a lot of information to cover, uh, and I know we have questions, so I want to ask our moderator if we could now turn and take as many questions as possible from people, you know, watching uh, this discussion online. Certainly. So we have a question from Deanne who says, how long can the virus last on a surface? Uh, please define long period of time. We actually had several questions uh, to, this, to this point. So this is a great question. And, and the honest answer is the, the data is still emerging. But the, from what we know now, it looks like it can last for five to seven hours on average on a given surface. We also know that the regular disinfectants that we're using in hospitals now kill the coronavirus. Um, so if we're using our environmental services protocols that are in place, we're gonna kill this thing um, and keep the spread uh, in terms of our facilities, whether it's the clinic or the hospital setting. Great, great question. 
Okay. Uh, we have another, I'm going to call it a grouping of questions. Uh, Juana asks, what is the proper gear to wear? Uh, Karen uh, asks, does wearing a mask protect you? What about people on the front lines? And there's <coughs> about when uh, healthcare workers should be wearing the N95 mask. Okay, great. Dr. These are really good questions. So, um, you know, for a person that's being evaluated for uh, COVID-19, um, the recommended gear or personal protective equipment are gowns, gloves, uh, a face <coughs> mask. Um, and, you know, right now, if they're not known to have COVID-19 and you're not performing a high-risk procedure, it's a surgical mask with a face shield or goggles. Um, why? Um, the reason for that is that it is primarily spread by droplets. Um, if the person has known COVID-19 um, or you're going to do a high-risk procedure, such as something like a nebulizer treatment, um, like Ruby might be doing, um, or you're doing an intubation, you're doing a bronchoscopy, that's where you need to be wearing a PAPR, or a PAPR is basically a hood with an air purifying device or an N95 respirator, which is what's being referenced here. And if I could ask our right. member, to Ruby, you're, you're, just you're sort of an expert, Dave, so you should let Ruby I'm comment. I'm just going to oh, say, in, Dave, Ruby. that we actually took counts, and we know exactly on our campus where our palpers are, where our N95s, how much we have left in storage. So we are looking, again, it's a it's a numbers game for us at AMC, and, it, and hopefully everybody everyone else should be doing it because we do have to monitor our equipment daily because it's so important. You know, especially if we change our protocols and we are going to follow, for instance, if we're going to be intubating um, patients in the ED blanketly in our isolation rooms times four, we need to have that equipment there ready on daily. So we need to do a count. So there, that's what the labor leaders, we at the facility, are monitoring continually. Do you mind if I comment on one other thing? That no, no, please go up? ahead. And then I want to raise another point that Sorry, came up yeah. in this question. No, she brought up a really good point, which is the isolation room question. Mm -hmm. So early on in the outbreak, um, we were essentially primarily putting people in airborne isolation rooms or negative mm -hmm. pressure rooms. Um, it's pretty clear now we've got a lot more COVID-19 disease um, than we have negative pressure rooms. Right. Um, and so, Again, the shift to mitigation calls for what is the most protective way you can take care of a patient safely. Um, if it's spread by droplets, by definition, you don't need a negative pressure room. You can safely put somebody in four walls um, by themselves, um, essentially an isolation room. So that's where we've moved with a number of our hospitals now. And I I noticed too that we had a follow-up question and because I think what you were just saying leads into it, what should, uh, what should be done if a healthcare worker is exposed to a positive patient? And I know there's a range of exposures, but if you could speak directly to that. Yes, and, and again, this is another area where the guidance has been changing over time, partly because we're learning more about how the virus is actually spread. Um, so the current recommendations from CDC um, are that if you have a low risk exposure, so um, you essentially weren't performing an aerosol generating procedure on a patient, um, but you maybe didn't have all the ideal personal protective equipment on, we're essentially treating that exposure like it would be if you got exposed to say influenza. So we're allowing individuals to continue to work, um, but they need to do what we call delegated self monitoring. So that means that you're checking your temperature twice a day um, and you're monitoring yourself for cold and cough. Um, if you develop those symptoms, then we don't want you working and then we do further evaluation. Great. So I'll ask the moderator if we could get to the, uh, to the next question that we have. Sure, so Sherry asked the question, what about patients that sit in the lobbies for hours? How effective are the masks? So this is a, another good question, and I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take it a little broader and then and mm -hmm. get to the specific question, which is the, the mask, you know, who should be wearing a mask? Um, and so this goes to, you know, when somebody's coming into the medical center or just in general, if they have a cold and cough, we want those people wearing a mask um, when they're traversing through our corridors. Why? 
because essentially you're actually not protecting them you're protecting the rest of the people around them because right. think about it you're gonna if they cough they can't spread those droplets because they've got that mask on <laughs> flip side should a healthy person be wearing a mask so in that case the mask is actually not particularly protective because after a while the mask gets saturated with what right. you're breathing right. Um, and so it doesn't really protect you from anything. But the masks are generally protective for a prolonged period of time if it's the person who's sick. Great. Okay, moderator. Yeah, so uh, this I'm gonna just kind of summarize. A, a lot of people have been asking, um, you know, what is it that they can do if they see uh, the steps are not being taken that you know, from this discussion and others, they, they believe should be taken. So uh, I'm ask that for the panel. Who wants to? So I can certainly, I can try to answer that from sure. Antioch. So we have our um, UHW leaders at the front line, again, working directly with senior leadership. And we have our numbers, our contact information written out there to immediately contact us or the leadership. We are communicating daily between the two groups. And if something, if there's a shortage or you still don't understand or nothing's posted in your department, please, um, at least for Kaiser, we want to know right away so we can correct it. Today, for example, at AMC, we found some departments still hadn't um, put up the newest protocol and uh, information. So we had two stewards walk the house and we're, you know, giving that information out and posting it. So it is a responsibility of both labor and management, but we, we need to hear about it um, at the moment. Tomorrow night, as I was telling Dave, um, I have a meeting with the respiratory department at AMC. So we're going to specifically talk about how to respond if things go haywire on that. So our stewards, we are out there pounding the pavement. I want to give Dennis and DeBrew an opportunity, you know, in the same vein, uh, if things aren't going as they're supposed to be going, you know, what's your experience been on information flowing, you know, back and forth between union leadership and, and hospital or clinic leadership? I don't know if you have something that you'd like to add, but we'd certainly like to hear it if you do. So this is DeBrew. So definitely in the Central Valley, um, our leaders, we have them on the calls. So um, our numbers are posted in generally we're in the cafeteria where our numbers are all posted. So they know how to get in contact with us. If they have any concerns, um, they are more than welcome to call us and we follow up with management and we speak to the issue. And if we need to escalate that to the COO and the, the heads of the Central Valley, because that's who we're talking to. And we want to make sure that the things that they're saying that are in place are in place. Uh, we want our members to work smart. Um, and they know that by um, us talking to them and they know who we are. And that's why we've been walking throughout the facility, making sure that we're rounding. Right. Thanks to Bruce. Dennis, anything to add from your perspective? Yeah. Uh Look, we, we have a number of different uh, labor management committees and uh, patient care committees that we can always go to. Um, what, you, what I would say to the average member right now is now is the time to get a hold of your local shop steward. Now is the time to start reaching out to your local rep. And if you don't have a shop steward and you don't have a rep chair, now is really the time to start getting involved. Uh, there's, there's ways that we can, we can hash this out at a table and sometimes, sometimes we've got to make some noise. This might be a make a noise, make some noise time. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Moderator, what's the next question that we have? Yeah, so we have a question looks like from Sulema who says, how long does it take for someone to develop symptoms if they've been exposed? And is there any risk of transmission while symptoms are in the developing stage? Yeah, great question. So the incubation period is the fancy term that we use for that. Um, and it's somewhere between two and 14 days after getting exposure. 
Um, and the answer is yes, you can actually transmit it before you even know you're infected. And in fact, a lot of people, they won't get any symptoms at all. Um, so yeah, that's the real kind of conundrum, if you will, with this, this virus. That's why it's spreading so right. easily. Right. So somebody who, to all appearances, looks fine, is what's called asymptomatic, they can be infectious and they can transmit it, never even know they had it and never develop anything serious. Right, that's right. No, that, that's a, a real predicament. All right, so moderator, what else do we have? Uh, so we have a question from Stephen who says, what is the exposure radius assuming a patient has COVID-19? And goes on to say, the reason I'm asking is our clinic stated three feet away and the CDC is stating six feet away. That's right. So um, the, the, the minimum distance is the three feet uh, distance. I mean, that's generally how far when you cough the, the droplets are going to go. Right. Um, and so that's the standard in terms of like distancing in a healthcare setting that we're going for is the three foot distance. Okay. Great. Next question. Uh, this question again is kind of a combination of a number of questions people are raising and it goes back to um, self quarantine and just the general guidance right now around uh, quarantine for healthcare workers in particular given importance and the role we play uh, you know, fighting this disease. So if you talk a little bit just about what, what should healthcare workers be taking as the guidance for self-quarantine at this point? Yeah, so, and, and this is a moving target, I'll just uh, be honest with you, but the current guidance is that um, what we were talking about to, before here, so if you've had an exposure but you're not sick, you can continue to work. And that's a change, right? I mean, originally it was, if you had any kind of potential exposure, you had to go home and you were home for 14 days. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll just be honest with you, when you think about that, that might work for a containment approach, but a mitigation approach where you got widespread illness, I think all of you know, we had several hospitals in California that had significant inability to staff properly. Um, so, you know, knowing now what we know, which is that it's droplet porn, um, that not everyone's going to get sick from it, um, that we can, you know, safely allow somebody to work and monitor their symptoms um, and then go off work then. Um, the current guidance, though, is that if you do develop COVID-19 disease as a healthcare worker, then you have to remain in quarantine until there's specific testing done that would allow you to come back to work. And the CDC has guidance around that. So it's additional uh, nasal and oral pharyngeal testing. Okay. And again, I just want to emphasize the point that Dr. Perotti made that, you know, over literally the last week or so, as this has evolved and changed, uh, that, that the guidance, as you said, has changed on um, the quarantining or the furloughing of this. And, and I, you alluded to it, and I just think it's important. And it's something we all talk about. Uh, inside of UHW because of the scale of this, um, that from a public health perspective, you know, if you're going to deal with a pandemic, you have to have a healthcare workforce that is maximally protected, that is, you know, we're doing everything we know how to do because you cannot manage a situation like this unless we have the trained caregivers and trained professionals that uh, that do this work. And so it's just an extra reason um, as we learn more about this, that, that we have to make sure that we're doing the things like the alternative treatments where we're keeping mm -hmm. foot traffic down and all of this will uh, continue to develop. But the, I, I think we're in a different situation now um, because of just the thousands and thousands of cases that we're dealing with. Um, so thank you to uh, our next question from the moderator. Yeah, so Christina asks, how much worse is this virus than the flu? So this is a great question, and it's uh, to be determined, but it does look like it has, for particular populations that I was talking about earlier, so the people that are older, the people that have chronic conditions, that they do get sicker, and, and they're getting sicker than just with the regular flu. Um, so that's why there's so much interest and, of course, vigilance uh, around this. Um, in terms of the vast majority of people, though, they actually are less ill than the flu, ironically. So again, we've talked about how a lot of people, they don't get sick at all. Um, with flu, it tends to, you know, if any of you have had the flu before, it puts you on your back, 
for a good couple of days. Uh, but that's not the case with this coronavirus. It's kind of interesting in the sense that some people get really sick from it and most people don't. But among the, I think it's fair to say, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that the COVID-19, it's more infectious than the flu. And it's a more serious thing for those who get sick than I, the flu. I think that's absolutely right. right. Um, you know, so it is spreading more easily than flu. Um, it's not spreading as easily as some other viral illnesses or other pandemics that we've had. Okay, okay moderator, next question. Uh, so again, there's a number of questions about testing and, uh, and I should say a number of concerns about lack of available tests in the United States in particular. And, and the question really goes at what is, was in this case, uh, Dr. Perotti, Kaiser Permanente doing about uh, the lack of tests and just uh, someone also, also asked if there's a way that employees can test themselves. So a lot of things related to testing. Yeah, no, and this is a really important subject because, of course, ideally, you can test to understand, you know, where is the disease um, and what do we need to do about it? How do you scale your response? And it's hard to scale your response if you don't know where the disease is. So the U.S. Um, has been behind in terms of ramping up testing. So largely, uh, really, literally a month ago, we only had one lab in the whole U.S. that was running testing. We now have most public health departments in California that can run the test, um, although on a limited capacity basis. We now have some private labs that are doing it. Specific to Kaiser Permanente, um, we're working to actually develop an internalized test. And I spoke with the lab leaders today, um, both for the North and the South. Um, and the hope is that we're gonna be able to start ramping up testing by as early as next week. Um, and when we talk about ramping up testing, we need to move beyond just a lab that can run 50 to 100 tests a day to something like what we do for flu, where we're running thousands of tests a day. Uh, and that's really the goal over the coming next week or two. Um, then that's the hope. And the part of that question is, is there any ability for people to test themselves? So right now that that is not um, possible, um, although it's an interesting question that you're raising because it actually gets into the social distancing uh, piece. So right now we're doing drive through testing um, in the future. And there are conversations about this occurring. Um, could you provide a training kit so that someone could do self testing? Um, and then be able to turn it in. Um, we do that actually with other um, infectious diseases right now in certain populations. So that is something that's under discussion, although I'll be honest with you, Dave, it hasn't been done before. Right, right. Well, I think we're in uncharted territory here. And as always, the hour goes by very, very quickly. So um, before we go to a final wrap up, uh, I'd like to give DeBru and Dennis uh, an opportunity. And, and I'd, I'd ask you just in your, your final comments, like, you know, going back to your workplace tomorrow, what will you take away from this conversation? What will you take back tomorrow? And then we'll go to Ruby and, and we'll conclude. But uh, why don't we start with DeBru? DeBru, final thoughts for you. Well, what I'll take back Tomorrow, I'll take some of the best practices that I'm hearing um, from Antioch uh, and raise some of the questions uh, that have not been answered for us that have been answered uh, in Antioch. So I know they can be answered. Um, definitely also look at how can we do more rounding. Um, I have stewards that we just need to find out what is our game plan because at the end of the day, it's our members. Um, and we want to make sure that we're working with the employer to get the most information out there as we can. And just how do we do that strategically where everybody's not panicked. Great. Thank you, DeBru. Dennis, how about from your perspective? <laughs> uh, well, look, I honestly, and, and I, DeBru, you always have the big picture. That's why you're <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm, what I want to do tomorrow is uh, circulate this video. I, I've been surprised at how many questions have come up tonight over the last 30 minutes that I hear almost every single day. And many times I don't have the answers. Um, and I, I think people are, are a little concerned as to where they can get those answers. So um, just, just some, some,
basic information or even some complicated information that we've gotten today, um, I think it's going to go a long way for uh, just helping people understand what's going on right now. Great. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Ruby, how about you? Um, I think for, for me, again, it's going to be focusing on communications and how we get information out very quickly. And as soon as we get it, we turn it around and get more of our external leaders involved, right? Our stewards are already very active at Antioch, but we need our external leaders. We need labor to really pay attention every day, the whole shift to what is going on on campus. Great. And again, Dr. Perotti, we really appreciate you coming, but final thoughts. I know this was your oh, first I, I Facebook just Live. What we're supposed yeah, to do okay, this. we'll month. do that. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, my final thoughts, you know, I, first of all, it's an honor to be speaking to all of you tonight. Um, and I guess today, depending on when you listen to this. Um, and I want to say that, you know, we are in this together. The only way we get through this pandemic is actually us working through the issues together. Um, and not everything will be done perfectly right off the bat. Um, and, you know, the, the shop stewards, um, you as healthcare workers raising the issues so that, you know, we as leadership know what is going on, really. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to put together the guidelines and put them out. And then there's a whole other thing about executing it. Um, and so, especially with something new, um, we need that input so that we can, you know, get as close to perfect as we can. Mm -hmm. And just from my perspective, I, I want to thank everyone for taking their time tonight. And I just want to remind people that we are committed to doing these discussions weekly. Uh, and for the next three to four months, it sounds like we'll be we'll be doing it uh, for that amount of time and longer if necessary. But again, we want this to be a resource. We want people to be able to get good information, get their questions answered. I think Dennis made a good point. Uh, about please circulate this if you find it useful and helpful and not just with your coworkers, but with your family, with people that you care about. Um, there really is a lack of high quality information out there. And lastly, I just want to encourage all of our members to please go to our website. Um, we have all sorts of materials on there. We're gonna regularly update it. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a copy of this video that people can share going forward. Uh, and it's also an opportunity you can leave questions and any communications that we get during the course of the next few days will help us inform uh, the conversation that we have next week. So I want to thank all of our guests. Uh, thank everybody for joining us tonight. You know, let's go back there tomorrow. Let's keep in touch. Let's be safe. Let's do everything we know how to do uh, and look out for each other. So thank you, everybody, and good evening. Uh, talk to you soon.